This Compass presentation, 10 Zinger Comebacks for Ding-A-Ling Bible Questions by Russ Miller was recorded live at a Stealing the Mind Bible Conference. To view more Stealing titles, get information on our Holy Land trips and future Bible conferences, go to compass.org. Well, good morning. How are you doing this morning? Awesome. Hey, uh, again, my name is Russ Miller. I live uh, in northern Arizona, uh, not too far, about an hour and a half from Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon being one of the five pillars of secular beliefs used to undermine people's faith in the Word of God. And yes, God has shown us how to take it and turn it upside down and actually show people the undeniable truth of God's Word. It's important to understand and believe God's Word today. I think Andy laid down a lot of good reasons for that. I want to talk about a few more. Uh, as we're told in 2 Corinthians, I fear lest by any means as a, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted in the simplicity that is in Christ. It is so easy to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You read God's word, you put your trust in the word of God, the word who came flesh and dwelt among us, and you spend eternity with him in heaven. But it's not that easy, is it? Why? Because Satan is really good at what he does. He is an expert. And he has a standard, what we call a standard operating procedure. That is to plant doubt in your mind. We call this doubt, deny, and deify. The, first, the way he does this is he asks questions. The first time Satan shows up in the Bible is in Genesis 3, verse 1. The first question posed in Scripture is Genesis 3, verse 1, where he says to Eve, Hath God said you're not to eat of every tree in the garden? And when Eve says, Well, if we eat of the one tree, we'll die, now he denies God's word. If you eat of the tree, you will not surely die. So plant doubt, then deny God's word, and then deify that person. If you go against God's word, you'll be as God yourself. Doubt, deny, and deify it's Satan's standard operating procedure. Michael Shermer went off to college to become a pastor. In college, he became convinced the world had evolved over billions of years of death and suffering, and he lost his faith, as do 80 to 85 of Christian kids today by the age of 20. That's been going on for 30 years now. He was one of the victims. He spent the rest of his life thus far uh, as an outspoken atheist, writing several anti-Christian books, and being the editor of Skeptic magazine. Skeptics employ questions to create doubt in people's mind. It's Satan's standard operating procedure. Did God really mean six days? Have you ever had someone ask you that question? They're planting seeds of doubt, my friends. Then deny God's word. We evolved over billions of years of death and suffering and then deify that person. You're the most evolved. You're your own God. We call that humanism today. Doubt, deny, and deify. A couple of years ago, members of the Skeptic Society in Arizona followed me around anywhere I spoke in Arizona, at a church, at a, at a men's group, at a woman's meeting, at a youth group, anywhere from 2 to 15 members of the Skeptic Society would be there. If I asked at the end of a church service, has anyone here not accepted Christ, they would all proudly raise their hands. And they pass out. They would stand outside and pass out their tracks. Atheists have tracks just as Christians have tracks because, hey, they are promoting their religious belief. Atheism is a religious belief. But they followed me around for a full year, and whenever I do a Q&A, they would hog the Q&A. All their hands would go up wanting to ask questions because that's how they plant seeds of doubt. And I would answer their questions and answer their questions. And one night, the uh, president of the Skeptic Society was there, and he asked several questions, which I answered. And after a while, he raised his hand again, and I said, hey, look, I, I've answered a lot of your questions. I would like for you to answer one of my questions. He said, well, what's that? I said, well, you're the member of, uh, uh, what's, it, what's the name of your group? He proudly said, the Skeptic Society. I said, oh, so, so you're um, skeptical. He said, that's right. Well, I said, well, I've just shown a dozen frauds in the textbooks used to fool people into believing in Darwinian evolutionism. Do you ever go into the biology classrooms and, and challenge the professors on the lies that they're putting forth? He said, well, well no, uh, we believe in Darwin. 
I said, oh, well, so you're not really the president of the Skeptic Society, you're president of the Hypocrite Society, isn't that right? <laughs> and they have never followed me around since. <laughs> I, have, I have no idea why. I was surprised the next weekend they didn't show up. But in Ecclesiastes, we're told it's better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. You know, the Bible tells us to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks. Um, Bill asked me to talk about answering skeptics and scoffers, because I do run into a few of them being a creation evolution uh, speaker. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting because I get a lot of weird emails, phone calls, etc. Here's one. It said, you say the Bible's the word of your God. Let's see you prove it scientifically. I get that type of question a lot. Someone said that to my friend Rick. He's out at our resource table, Rick Gately. Oh, boy, this was a few years ago. Rick grabbed the guy in a headlock and started twisting his nose back and forth until the guy's nose started to bleed. And he let the guy go, and the guy said, Rick, why did you do that to my nose? He said, well, you asked me to prove the Bible's true scientifically, and in Proverbs we're told the ringing of the nose will bring it forth blood. So, <laughs> you know, but the Bible needs to be taken in the full context, and the full context is to give an answer with meekness and fear. And, and no, I was just kidding, Rick did not do that. But sometimes we think about that, but we don't actually act on that. That's, that's the flesh side, right? You know, so how do we respond to skeptics and scoffers? Uh, personally, I like to stand my ground because I, I feel confident in the word of God. I try to be meek and kind, but I also try to use a little humor. And a lot depends on the individual that you're talking to. Are they really a skeptic? Or are they honestly looking? I'm really talking about skeptics and scoffers today, professionals. I got this Facebook message. As a college student, I no longer believe the Bible because my textbooks say it was written by men. Well, I just responded, well, men led by the Holy Spirit, but uh, by the way, who wrote your textbooks? <laughs> no wonder Jesus said, take heed that no man deceive you. Here's a tweet I received. You're such a moron. The Bible was written by a bunch of sheep herders. It's full of errors and contradictions. You ever hear something along those lines? I just responded, name calling is always the last bastion for those with no facts to support their position. The Bible is written by 40 authors. It ranged from priests and kings to fishermen, tax collectors, and so forth. And, you know, King David, he, he did start out as a sheep herder. But it's written in three languages, in 15 countries, on three continents over a 1,500-year period of time. And yet there's not, it is a one unified account without a single contradiction or error that will stand up to true scrutiny. Here's another one. The Bible's a bunch of man-made fairy tales. I said, well, let's consider the archaeological and the prophetic facts. First of all, back in the 19th century, skeptics came up with the geologic time scale um, based on the belief there was never a global flood. The Earth's crust, those sedimentary layers stratified out by grain size, weight, and density by moving water, didn't form in a flood. No, they formed slowly over millions and billions of years. This led to the first major fruit of old Earth beliefs, and we tell good from bad by the, by the what? By the, by the fruit. Darwinism. Darwinian evolution is a fruit coming from the old earth beliefs, and these two have combined to crush Christianity around the world today. And then they began denying the existence of the various kings and nations cited in the Old Testament. But during the 20th century, archaeologists found proof of more than 40 of those ancient kings and nations. In fact, two of the most famous 20th century archaeologists, uh, Gluck and Albright, stated the Bible is the single most accurate source document from history. Today it's used to map out the ancient Middle Eastern areas. And uh, Andy talked about prophecy. Uh, you know, the Bible is the only book in the history of the world that survives on its ability to correctly predict the future. The Bible says if, if prophecies in a religious text don't come true or from a prophet, then you know it's a false teaching. Uh, depending on how you total these up, the Bible has over 2,000 prophecies. 
over 90% of those have already come true with 100% accuracy. Many are taking place right before our eyes. In, in the last 75 years, some of the prophecies are spectacular. Israel, after not existing for 1,800 plus years, in one day becomes a nation again. That was all foretold. They returned they returned as non-believers, as foretold. They returned to speaking Hebrew, as foretold. They were a stumbling block to the world, as foretold. You know, Andy showed that map, and Israel's this little bitty red dot. <laughs> it's not even 1% of the Arab countries, yet it is a stumbling block to the world. This was all foretold. In fact, of the remaining prophecies in Scripture, most of them will take place during the tribulation. We stand at the door today. Uh, here, here's another tweet I got. The, the Bible's flood story was stolen from the epics of Gilgamesh. You need to explain this. Yes, you. <laughs> I thought, well, I better explain this because <laughs> otherwise I'm going to be in trouble. So I just responded, no, the biblical accounts led to many flood legends, including the epics of Gilgamesh. Uh, after the global flood, God had commanded people to spread around the globe, and they didn't do so. They gathered at Babel and built the uh, Tower of Babel. They started coming up with all these false religions. Now, they started with the true religion and the true flood account, but as they handed this down, it started to deviate, and today we have over 300 ancient flood legends. Almost every ancient civilization starts out with a count of a flood and a few people that survived to repopulate the world. But if you want to see the one true account, it's right there in the book of Genesis. You can read it any time. Here's another. I delight seeing Christianity erased from society in the year 2020 of the Common Era. I responded, well, let me know once Christianity is erased, I won't be holding my breath. <laughs> They've been trying to erase it now since uh, the Garden of Eden, right? Um, first of all, realize that... Um, they, of course, they are trying to, to get rid of, you know, uh, before Christ with uh, BCE, before the Common Era, and Common Era today. But where, a year is derived from one revolution of the earth around the sun. A month is loosely derived from one revolution of the moon around the earth. A day comes from one spin of the, a the earth upon its axis. Where does a seven-day week come from that the world operates upon? comes from biblical creation. In fact, and from the uh, Ten Commandments, for in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth to see, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Try as they might, they will never erase Christ and Christianity from society. The, the Bible tells us God will sit in the heavens uh, the, the, while the kings and the rulers of the world take counsel against God and his anointed. God will be laughing at them. He will have them in derision. He will have them in confusion. They, they think they're going to get rid of him. They can't do it. They've been trying since the dawn of man. Here's one. You worship three gods, a supposed father plus a son plus a ghost. Learn how to add. I say, well, you know, actually we worship a triune God who's manifested himself in three divine persons, being the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting because God's creation reflects this triune character of space, matter, and time. And each of these entities have a triune character. A space is height, width, and depth. Matter comes in solid, liquid, and gas. And time comes in the past, the present, and the future. And the fact of the matter is one father times one son times one Holy Spirit is one God, not three. Learn how to multiply. <laughs> Here's another email. Your Bible says Jesus was crucified the third hour, yet Pilate, he was with Pilate the sixth hour. Talk about a contradiction. These type of things are used by skeptics to slaughter young Christians' faith, my friends. How do we respond to this? I simply said, since you lack understanding, I see how this would appear to be a huge contradiction to you. Let me help you out with it. In John, we're told that Jesus was was before Pilate the sixth hour, but in Mark we're told he was crucified the third hour. Is that a contradiction in the Bible? 
Well, no, you see, John was writing to the Gentiles and the Romans. So he was using Roman nomenclature. And in the Roman uh, nomenclature, a day's hour started at midnight. So the sixth hour would have been around 6 a.m. Now, Mark was writing to the Jews while their Sabbath started at sundown. The hours of the day started at sunrise. So the third hour of the day would have been three hours after sunrise. If sunrise was at 6 a.m., he would have been crucified about 9 a.m. No contradiction in the Bible. He stood before Pilate around 6 a.m. and was crucified around 9 a.m. No contradiction in the Bible, my friends. When they come up with something that might stump you, don't think that they're right. Just realize you need to get some help and look into some evidence. Uh, the Word of God is, is perfect, and it's trustworthy for guiding your life. Don't let skeptics undermine your faith. Here's one. Your idiotic Bible claims all who call on the name of Jesus will be saved. But Jesus said that's not true. Which one's wrong? Ha, ha. Well, I just emailed back or Facebook back. Speaking of idiotic, uh, thank you for your email. <laughs> Neither one is wrong. You know, in the New Testament, both Peter and Paul state, uh, quoting from the book of Joel, uh, whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. But in Matthew 7, Jesus says, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom. Jesus says, not everyone who says, calls on his name will be saved. Well, here's what Jesus is actually saying. Again, you've got to look at the whole context in Matthew 7. Jesus is saying, we must call on the one true Christ to be saved. Making up a false Christ and calling on him is going to cause you some problems. What Jesus is saying is beware of false prophets. Beware of false teachers which come to you in sheep's clothing. Sheep's clothing. Watch out for the sheep. Everyone's looking out for the wolves. You don't have to look out for the wolves. You can spot a wolf 10 miles out. You've got to watch out for the sheep. They will speak the best Christian ease you have ever heard. They know the Bible inside and out, just as does Satan who can disguise himself as an angel of light. Jesus says, watch out for the sheep who inwardly are ravening wolves and will mislead many. How in the world do you tell a sheep from a wolf if they look the same? You'll know them by their fruits, so says Jesus Christ. If they are leading you to false beliefs, and he covered many of them, and especially if they are leading you to a different Jesus, other than the one and only Jesus of the Bible who said he is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody will come to the Father but by him, if they are leading you to a different Jesus, turn and run screaming at the top of your lungs. Get away from them. People embrace them today. You see, the one true Christ is found in the non-compromised word of God. Here's another uh, tweet. You can't explain biblical oddities like Adam and Eve's two sons leading to 7 billion people in 6,000 years. Well, I just tweeted back, well, you not understanding what the Bible says doesn't make something a, a biblical oddity. You know, Adam lived over 900 years and they had three sons mentioned in Genesis, but they most likely had hundreds of children, thousands of grandchildren, tens of thousands of great-grandchildren, and on it goes. And this, this scoffer has really missed something important from his standpoint. He's saying, how could they, they come up with 7 billion people in 6,000 years? Hey, we had to do it in 4,500 years. He missed that one. You know, God judged man's sin once already with a flood that covered all the hills under the whole heaven. That would be a global flood. That event is the linchpin in the war of worldviews today. The secular beliefs are based on there never having been a global flood, as foretold would happen in 2 Peter 3, 3 through 6. Uh, but if there was a flood, it wipes out the beliefs. I'll explain that in a couple of moments. But this was about 44, 4,500 years ago. And eight people, four couples, Noah, his three sons, and their wives, four couples survived the flood 45 or so hundred years ago. So how did uh, all seven billion people come from just four couples in 4,500 years? 
Or if you look at a human uh, growth chart, population growth chart, if you started with four couples about 4,500 years ago, if they average having 2.2 children per couple, you would have over 7 billion people on Earth today. Census studies say there are over 7 billion people on Earth today. National Geographic did a study of the human genome, came to the conclusion all humans come from one of four couples. <laughs> I hope they didn't spend a whole lot of money on that study because they could have just read the book of Genesis and figured that out, right? Wow. As a Christian with a college degree, I see you as an embarrassment to the faith. Face it, Darwinian evolution is a proven fact. Well, I said, well, as a Christian with a college degree, I say professing themselves to be wise, many will become fools. <laughs> and they'll change the glory of the uncorruptible God, which I think today is his creation, into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. I think they're going to change creation in the fairy tale of Darwinian evolutionism that lets you think you're the most evolved, you're your own God. We call that humanism today. But a review of Darwinism versus real science, a believer's best friend, will show us that no one has ever seen anything Darwinian macro evolve. I stand on college campuses and I say this loud and I say it clear. All the professors have to do is give one example to blow me out of the auditorium. They can't do it. It never happened. The fossil record shows no missing links that will stand up to scientific scrutiny. And out of the hundreds of millions of living species on Earth today, we don't have a single half this, half that flopping around anywhere. It's the biggest fairy tale in the history of mankind. And if Darwinian evolution is an issue for you or someone you know, I cover it in our top 10 Darwinian teachings. And as you see all these uh, examples of Darwinian change out of the textbooks, you ever notice how they're always drawings? Yeah, there's an old saying that goes like this, Darwinists are experts at drawing things that never existed to support their theory that never took place. If you take away their magic markers, they are left with nothing. Another prophecy given to the ancient Israelites in Jeremiah said that people would turn their back on God, saying to a stone, thou has brought me forth. Saying that we came from a stone? Well, here's a modern textbook. Earth is thought to have formed four and a half billion years ago, and it started out as a big ball of hot rock, and oceans formed as it rained on the stone for millions of years, and poof, here we are today. They're teaching we came from a wet rock. I cover this in our science and Darwinism. The scientific impossibilities are, you know, the, this hammer was found encased in rock. If I told you the hammer was evolving from the rock, what would you think of me? <laughs> you would think I'm crazy, right? Well, why wouldn't you believe the hammer is evolving on its own from the rock? Well, it shows too much intelligent design to have formed on its own, right? And design even of the magnitude of a simple hammer demands a designer be behind it. Yet all it is is a piece of iron and a stick put together. You, your children, and your grandchildren are hundreds of billions times hundreds of trillions times more complex than a hammer. Why do we sit back and let our schools teach our kids they evolve from a wet rock while we lose up to 90% of our children and grandchildren? Unbelievable. Uh, speaking of design, here's an, here's an email. Give it up. Even the Supreme Court says there's no designer. I email back, give it up yourself. The Supreme Court has never said such a thing. At issue is de the definition of the word science. It's not a matter of evidence. It's matter, a matter of the definition of the word science, which is defined as the pursuit of knowledge of the natural world or of naturally occurring phenomena. So you take something like intelligent design to the court, you will lose every single time. It doesn't matter how many zillions of examples of intelligent design you have, it, it indicates there's a designer, which would mean it's not naturally occurring, so it does not fit the definition of the word. It has nothing to do with the evidence. It will lose every time because it does not fit the definition. Do you see that? The evidence of, of intelligent biblical design, by the way, is overwhelming. 
you know, the, just the genetic information. It is beyond human comprehension. I, only think, I honestly think we only stand, understand maybe 2% of the, of the genetic information today. But we now know it can read forwards and backwards. And we think diagonally. The best human technology reads in one direction. Try to get home today and take a one-page paper and on one side write the directions on how to build a computer. But it has to read backwards to tell you how to build a lawnmower and diagonally to tell you how to build a cell phone. Try, try to do it. The best human technology with computers only reads in one direction. Genetic information shows so much design it's beyond our comprehension. And it's so compactly stored the genetic information to code for all 7 billion plus people on earth today could fit inside of a container the size of an eraser. Wow, complexity beyond human comprehension. Do you really think that came from a wet rock? Hmm, of course not. So see, scientists have a problem. They look at this extreme complexity of genetic information and they try to answer where did it come from? How did it originate? We see they've already ruled out the answer before they started by saying things have to be naturally occurring. Well, the problem is it's not naturally occurring. They can't answer it. It would be if it's, if it's, as if mathematicians decided that the number three could never be accepted as an answer, and they tried to answer the simple calculation, then one plus two equals what? They've ruled out the answer. They can't answer it. Same thing has happened in science today. Speaking of science, here's a Facebook message. Peer-reviewed science journals don't have articles supporting the Bible because you're a filthy liar. <laughs> you know, this is just simply the old uh, liar, liar, pants on fire attack. <laughs> and, and the truth of the matter is the peer review process has been completely corrupted. It is worse than useless. And don't take my word for it. Let's go to the editor of the uh, Lancet which is a British medical journal. It's the most prestigious medical journal in the world. A couple of years ago, they had to retract over 100 of their previously published articles, over 100, saying the peer review process is so corrupt. Think about what he says here. Half of scientific literature may be untrue. He said these guys are reviewing their own papers or saying, hey, you review my paper, I'll review your paper. And the review process is run by people that are 30, 40 years out of their practice, the most out-of-touch practitioners in their fields. It's totally corrupt. And he went on to state, scientists often sculpt data to meet their preferred theory of the world, which is billions of years leading to the fairy tale of Darwinian evolutionism. In fact, the editor of the New England Journal, Journal America's most uh, prestigious scientific journal, stated, think about what she says, it is no longer possible to believe much of clinical research. Wow, let that sink in. Billions of years leading to Darwinism is a pair of religious beliefs that have undermined scientific research, scientific education, and the saving faith of billions of people. Never has a single Bible verse been refuted or need to be retracted. The Bible tells us to avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Wow. Doesn't say avoid science. Science is your best friend, real science. Avoid false science, like these false peer reviewed journals. And here's another Facebook message. Science refutes the Bible. All you do is spread lies. Well, you know, once again, this is the old liar, liar, pants on fire attack. Oh, I thought you guys would recognize that person. <laughs> My friends, remember... When someone starts calling me names, I've got them right where I want them. <laughs> and I always look them in the eye and say, hey, I'm sorry, but name calling is the last bastion for those that have no evidence to put forth. And they've got none, so it just shuts them down. And after a couple minutes, they'll start name calling again. You, you mention this again, and everyone around you starts to realize, hey, they really don't have anything, do they? No, except for name calling. 
Now, science does not refute the Bible at all. Over 80% of the branches of modern science are started by Christians to study God's creation. You know, the Bible says about, about this global flood, a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven, and that plants and animals will only bring forth after their kind. This can be scientifically verified. You know, if there had been a global flood, I'd expect the outer crust of the earth to be made up of sedimentary layers of rock, stratified out by moving water, separated by grain size, weight, and density. So you have all shale layers, all mudstone, all sandstone, etc. And today, the outer crust of the earth averages a mile deep of sedimentary layers laid down by water, stratified out by grain size, weight, and density, full of billions of dead things that were buried so quickly they didn't have time to rot away or get eaten by scavengers. We call those things fossils today. The Bible says 10 times in Genesis that plants or animals will only bring forth after their kind. Today, all we find is people will only produce people. Dogs will only produce dogs. Pine trees will only produce pine trees. Kinds will only bring forth after their kind. This is caused by the sorting or the loss of the genetic information uh, created from the start in the Garden of Eden. Um, and natural selection is actually God's QA program that keeps his originally created types strong. Here's another. Your God has people stoned to death. Where's your loving God? Lots of laughs. Well, the Old Testament stoning pertained to a dispensation and Jewish people who were under the Jewish government and Jewish law. The biblical God gave us a perfect creation with no death, no evil, no suffering. What happened to it? Adam's original sin. Adam's original sin corrupted the creation, allowing death to enter, but more importantly, separated us from our loving God, requiring Jesus' sacrifice on the cross to redeem us with him for eternity. I call that the cost. Creation, original sin, separation, and the cross. It is the foundation for the gospel message. And in 1 Corinthians, we're told the last enemy that will be destroyed when Jesus returns is death. Death is an enemy to God's creation. It's not how he, a tool he used to get us here. And Jesus will give us a new heaven and a new earth in the coming future where there'll be no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow. It doesn't get much more loving than that, my friends, correct? But, my friends, if you're concerned about people uh, being stoned, you should know that Oregon and Washington have both legalized marijuana, which means that people are probably getting stoned as I speak, but you'll have to take that up in the Pacific Northwest. Really? I'm a pastor and I accept old earth beliefs. You're delusional if you think the Bible's flood story is true. Over 90% of our seminaries and colleges teach old earth beliefs. That over 90% that put death before Adam, undermining that Adam's sin brought in death, separating us from God. I wrote back, uh, speaking of delusional, perhaps you should take a step back and consider what the Bible says. We're told in 2 Peter, knowing this first, so come in the last days scoffers, being willingly ignorant that by the word of God, the world that was being overflowed with water perished. 1900 years ago, the Bible foretold in the last days scoffers would deny the global flood. Why would you deny the global flood? Well, again, the old earth beliefs were invented 200 years ago based on a belief there was never a global flood and the earth's crustal layers stratified out by grain size, weight, and density didn't form quickly in a flood but formed slowly over millions and billions of years of time. Uh, those layers are full of those dead things, those fossils. That means death existed before man existed. And these death before Adam beliefs, don't, you know, Christians don't understand. It does, oh, why does it matter what the age of the earth is? Well, besides it gives the foundation for Darwinism, naturalism, humanism, secularism, etc., besides it denies God's word, here's the key from a Christian standpoint, it puts death before Adam. Once you put death before Adam, you can't teach Adam's sin brought in death, separating us from God. Do you see that? And that, did I ever mention Satan is really good at what he does? You see, the best thing you can do is read God's word and put your faith in the word of God. See, once you've taught that death existed before Adam, you can't teach the cost. The foundation of the gospel message has been undermined, and over 90% of our seminaries and colleges teach these beliefs. Wow. 
And if one of our teachings is the evil fruit of old earth beliefs, one of the first fruit of old earth beliefs is Darwinism. These two combined as a juggernaut. We kicked creation prayer out of our schools in 1963. By 1965, the drug culture exploded. By 1906, the sexual revolution exploded. By 1973, we legalized abortion. We've killed over 60 million U.S. citizens in the womb. This is all fruit coming from old earth beliefs. Anyone think still the age of the earth doesn't matter? It is everything to the enemy. Enemy, everything. I can go on a college campus and destroy Darwinism. Love to do it, easy to do. Uh, they all I have to do is give an example of Darwinian change. They can't do it. But if I start talking about the age of the earth, I have to have bodyguards, lots of bodyguards. They understand the issues. You know, organic samples from all the fossil-bearing layers have been found to still contain carbon-14, which is measured in carbon dating, that should be gone in less than 100,000 years. We're told those layers are 600 million years old. And the amount of carbon-14 is the same from the top layer through the bottom, meaning they all formed in the same event. And nothing but a global flood can explain that. Here's a picture of an entire school of fish buried by sediment flow very quickly. Here's, a, here's a, a fish that was buried while eating another fish. Here's an ichosaur buried while giving birth. Obviously, something very sudden and catastrophic took place. No wonder the Bible says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, and not after Christ. One of the things I show people besides Creation Rock and where the first of the flood layers come in at Grand Canyon is if you're on the rim of the canyon, it's a mile down to the river. A mile of sedimentary layers stratified out by water. What they don't tell you there used to be two miles of layers above the rim that have been removed from southern Utah to the sea 150 times more sediments than it was removed from that puny little Grand Canyon. There's no way to explain it but flooding on a global scale. Uh, here's, here's another uh, email. My professors say horrible things about Christians, yet if I'm intolerant about anyone else, I could be expelled. Why is this? Well, there's two main reasons. One, your many of your professors are 10 pounds of manure and a one-pound baggie. That's, oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. That, that's, that was what I was thinking. That's not what I said. Uh, what I said was, your professors believe in ABC tolerance, and Christianity is a real thing. Let me explain this. ABC tolerance is practiced on campuses around the globe. It means anything but Christianity. Why? Satan is the god of this secular world. He's certainly the god of our secular schools and colleges. He doesn't want kids wasting their time attacking non-believers. He already owns all non-believers. But Christianity is the real thing. And that's why it's okay to attack and say any putrid thing you want about a Christian on a college campus today when you cannot say boo to anybody else. Because Christianity is the real thing. Jesus Christ is the real deal. Put your trust in the Jesus of the Bible. And Jude tells us to earnestly contend for the faith. The calling of our ministry is to teach about creation, evolution, and age of the earth issues. To uh, provide a reason for the hope that's in the heart of all true believers and all true seekers. I'll end with this. Another Facebook message. I guess only the really stupid people go on your trips. <laughs> I just messaged back, no, not normally, but you are more than welcome to sign up. <laughs> God bless you guys. Have a great day. You've been watching 10 Zinger Comebacks for ding -a Bible Questions, presented by Russ Miller. To view more stealing titles, get information on our Holy Land trips and future Bible conferences, go to compass.org.